Here we go. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to the show. Welcome to the stream. This is Diagnose Your Chess. This is a weekly show that I do with uh, Coach Chess and Chess24, uh, where I invite a new student every week, someone I've never worked with before, and we talk a little bit about their chess. We go over through games, and I try to give my honest advice and opinions on, on how they should try to improve their chess. Um, so today with me, I have uh, Gustavo. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. And, Thank you for having um, me. Real quick, maybe you could let everyone know like your age and where you're from. So I'm 16. I'm uh, from Puerto Rico. I've been playing chess since I was little, but I only got to about a thousand online strength. strength. And uh, I got back to chess about a year ago. And since then, I've been able to go to a couple of over the board tournaments and started taking my chess a lot serious, a lot more seriously than when I was younger. And I've been able to get up to about 1,600 online on chess.com. Cool, cool. So nowadays, like, how are you, um, how, what kind of time control are you usually playing when you play online? So usually I'm playing 1510. I don't really like to play Blitz a lot because I feel like it makes me play worse when I'm trying to play seriously on Rapid or, or Classical. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I'll usually play about a game or two per day. And I'm also playing, at least recently, I started playing um, 60 t 10 games, so 60 minutes with 10 second increment, nice. once a week in a, in a friendly league I created with a couple of friends of mine. Cool, so you're playing those like once a week? Nice, nice. Yes, once a week. Um, awesome, yeah, it's really important to just try to play like in general, longer time control games, just spending more time thinking about you know, the moves that you're making is always useful. And um, are you doing anything for like your chess training, like tactics or solving or anything like that? Yeah, so usually I'll start my day with about an hour of tactics online on chess.com. Uh, after that, I'll play one game of uh, 15 ton. And if I see that I lost or that it was a complicated game, then I'll try to analyze it um, quickly without the board, without the uh, engine, and then turn on engine al analysis. Mm -hmm. And um, but if not, if it was like a straightforward game, then I'll play another one, or I'll just look at the analysis really quick and then play another one. Gotcha. After after that, um, I try to see if I have any time in the afternoons to play to work on my openings because I'm, I have a tournament, an overboard tournament at the end of the month, and I'm trying to prepare a little bit for that. So I'm working on my openings now that I have that sort of um, uh, time related thing to dedicate my openings to. Right? What kind of tournament and, is uh, that going to be like uh, over the weekend? Yeah, yeah, weekend tournament, uh, 9030. Oh, nice. Open, semi-open, because there's a limit of players, but it's going to be really cool. Cool, cool. We'll try to uh, prep you. I see San Miguel in the chat is saying that you are the founder of your school chess club. That's awesome. That's and true. that you've, yeah. you've taught a bunch of people how to play chess. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I, um, I, and it's actually San Miguel has helped me a lot with that. And uh, also shout out to Diego Martinez, who might also be in the chat um they've both helped me a lot to uh build the chess club and to teach other other students how to play chess and uh sort of lay that foundation which has you know sort of created a small chess culture in our school that's great i mean one of the best ways to learn something is to actually be forced to teach it to others so yeah. if um yeah, it's a great excuse to like learn some classic games is to just have a class once a week where you're like, all right, we're going to look at some classic games and then you'll have to research them yourself and try to understand what, what happened. Um, now, Sam, you also Definitely. said you're 2600 in tactics. Is that true? Yeah. On chess.com 2650, I think. Oh, wow. Do you also do the, yeah. uh, the puzzle rush? A little bit. I, I'm not very good at it. I think the most I've gotten is 21 on a three minute. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so you like to like take your time then on the problems? Yes, yes, I do. That's another thing that probably contributes to uh, like sort of a higher 
tactics rating. Um, I I don't I'm not scared of taking like five or six minutes on a tactic, um, or as much as it takes to try to get it right and understand the problem. Okay, that's good because you're working on your like classical chess, which is longer time control, and that's something where you're gonna have time to calculate. It's not so much about finding tactics super quickly, but rather like delving deep into the position and like actually seeing some some lines. So that I, I'm happy that you're uh you're doing that and then beyond tactics and uh playing do you do anything like reading any books or like watching videos or anything like that yeah um usually my uh my free time like if i'm i'm eating lunch or just sort of trying to rest a little bit between classes i'll i'll watch uh some john bartholomew i really like his uh climbing the rating ladder um cool. i'll watch some agadmator obviously and uh, in terms of uh, books, obviously, I, why obviously? I know. <laughs> oh, I mean, he is the chess personality. But um, <laughs> in terms of uh, chess books, I'm reading uh, "Chess Strategy for Club Players" by uh, Herman Gruden. Oh, okay. I started good reading book. it nice. just uh, mm -hmm. recently, and it's a really, really good book. I I've barely gotten into it, but from what I've read, I I, I really love it. Awesome. And how often are you reading that? I uh, just whenever I can. I I I don't think I've read it for uh, at least the last week, but um, I got it about a month ago, and I've I've read about five chapters on it. Okay, I mean that that's a good book. That's a really good author, uh, Herman Gruden. I, I like his stuff. So I mean, it sounds like your your tactics might be good. So if that's like the thing to work on, I would say like just try to read a little bit every day. Do you do you work like with a physical chessboard? Yes, I, I always try to play through the uh, variations on a board and for the games. Awesome. Do you have it like set up or do you have to set it up every time? Um, the chessboard, do you mean? Yeah. Or like the positions? Yeah, yeah, the um, I, yeah sometimes I have like a, a stationary board and I also have a travel board. Sometimes I like to sit down outside a little bit to read so I can clear my mind too mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, breathe fresh air. But, okay, um, well, that's awesome. Yeah, so sometimes I use a travel chessboard, sometimes I use the, the regular one. Okay, try to have a board set up, like, at all times. If it's always ready to go, it'll be much easier to uh, to use it. And then if you just have, like, a, a soft goal, like, you just want to read a little bit every day, like, three, four pages or three, four examples, right? Like, doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, you'll get through it really, really uh, quickly. Um but, uh, okay, so yeah, also I wanted to say, yeah, John Bartholomew has a great channel. He has some really, really instructive videos, and there's some, there's some really good stuff out there. Um, okay, well, let's start looking at maybe some of your games. So I guess today I'll, I'll try to give you some guidance, although I feel like you're already kind of like on the right track. Have you played a 90-30 like classical game before? Yeah, so I started playing uh, over-the-board classical tournaments, um, I think, in October of um, 2019. Mm. And um, I've, played, I've played only about three or four, um, I think, like, four or five, actually. Wow. Usually weekends or tournaments. Yeah, that was, like, the worst time to start playing because you need mm -hmm. some time to, like, adjust, and then immediately everything was <laughs> cut off. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, at least you got some experience, so that's mm -hmm. that's good. It really is, I mean, a whole different thing, playing online versus uh, over the board. Um, okay, so I just picked this game at random. This looks like uh, Petrov. Do you do you remember this one? Um, I think, yeah, this is the, uh, this is the, the one of the 60-10 games I was talking about, actually against um, San Miguel, who's in the chat. Um, <laughs> that's, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. I um I played this uh sixty ten game and uh, I I played it on a over the, like over the board, sort of um playing it on my phone and also over the board to try to visualize a little bit better. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. So um, yeah. So I mean, I'm guessing you already analyzed this game a little bit. Yeah, I, I looked it over um with Samuel and with the engine, but I haven't uh looked it over. I think what it deserves, um you know sort of thoughts deep thought with uh with other players mm -hmm. well do you have some idea of where you think because uh, i know you, you ended up losing this game but where do you think you 
ended up going wrong? Um, well, there was sort of this plan that wasn't the most sound, which was playing c5 and then knight e5. But I also hung a pawn, and I actually kind of wanted to talk about that because this was a 60-10 game, and it was a very simple blunder. Like, it was just a blunder that should have never happened, mm. uh, which I think is something that maybe happens a bit in my games. Oh, I see. So he plays bishop f6, mm -hmm. you win rook e1, then just snap, snap, and takes on c5. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes, you know, we just don't really, like, pay attention to our opponent's ideas. It's, like, very common, I'll tell you, at pretty much all levels uh, it can happen. Um, it's just much easier in general to spot your own tactics, just psychologically, because you're, you're playing with white's pieces, so you're looking for your own opportunities. And then, um, even though your opponent is making moves, we're not always, like really paying attention to what they're doing. Um, so one kind of skill that I think players often develop over time is just you learn to appreciate exactly what the opponent is threatening. And it's not too difficult to explain. Basically what happens for me is like as soon as a move is played, like bishop f6, my brain just like immediately jumps into uh, like a tactics check. You know, like what's their next move? Do they have a threat? And then I might see like for example, oh, knight takes c5 might be one way to win a pawn, or like bishop takes e5. I mean, not always, I'll definitely miss stuff, but the idea is you want to kind of get into the habit of always kind of immediately checking like, oh, what are they, what are they now threatening? Um, basically with any move. And you want to do the reverse as well, like what are they now hanging? Uh, because every move is always going to leave some squares behind, and so a lot of times if a move is a blunder, you can kind of spot it just by understanding like, well, which squares are now uh, left un undefended. This becomes more obvious, you know, with like pawn moves. When someone makes some random pawn move, our brain might like immediately see the square that's now kind of like undefended. And you kind of learn to do that with, with peace moves as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, basically it happens. And like, whenever I think about me doing these things, it's because I like wasn't, I don't know, fully focused or something, like not being really really careful uh i think that's just like pretty pretty typical and what can you say over time it gets better <laughs> um let's talk about the c5 move though because this one i would say feels more like a strategic mistake yeah. um and what do you, what do you think is the the problem with this move i think maybe it's a little bit too committal I have some nice tension on the center. I have a, a flank pawn attacking a center pawn, and maybe c5 is sort of fixing this pawn structure, which is maybe a bad move. Bad move. Yeah, basically, right, you're kind of letting go of all your pressure against black center. And in fact, if we think about the Petrov, you know, conceptually, this is like your whole idea, because this is the position that we're getting, and it it's like a symmetrical position except black got an extra move knight e4 and the whole point of white's play is to argue that this move knight e4 is not good for black's position because the knight can be undermined with a move like c4 um, and this kind of is, is white's entire strategy i think like knight c3 is probably a move here because this puts more pressure on the knight on e4 and then if black takes this one bc of course white is going to be able to uh to trade off the uh, one of the c-pawns if, if you want or here you, you know you can advance c5 and argue that like you have this open b file for your rook that's going to be like pretty annoying so this is like a structure that white can kind of argue you have like a kind of a small initiative in um, i think the way you played it is reasonable with queen c2 because here you're kind of following the plan you know putting pressure on the knight on e4 and so this is basically what is supposed to inform the strategy. Now black plays f5, very committal move, but very logical move, because he wants to uh, control the e4 square. And yeah, when we play c5, then it's like we, we give black a free hand now on the king side, um, because there's no more pressure in the center. So in general, when the opponent has somewhat weakened their king side, like with this f-pawn, we kind of want to keep some pressure alive. So the queen really loves using this diagonal at some point to kind of put pressure on on the king um so yeah my first instinct in a position like this would be something like uh taking and queen b3 and then just kind of putting some pressure there reminding black that d5 pawn has to be defended um 
And then yeah, knight can still come to e5 and we're, I think we're in good shape. Um, okay, let's see what happens. So here, rook e1, so took this one, now knight takes d5. Oh, some tactics yeah. here. Yeah, I had sort of calculated, um, I hadn't seen, obviously, on knight takes d5 and that my pawn, my pawn was hanging. But after this, I had sort of calculated all of the variations, and I determined that I was okay. Although I missed a key move at the end. Oh, I see. So let's see what happened. Wow, this was really sharp. So check here. Takes. Oof, queen d1. Huh. Queen f1. Ship e6. And, uh, yeah, I guess Black's Rook is kind of more active here. Um, and now, now Bishop c4, kind of a big threat, huh? Yeah, that's sort of the key move I had missed. Because sort of in the middle of the variation back in, um, in Queen c4, I had noticed that at the end my opponent had, could play Queen d1, but I thought after Queen f1 I, I would be okay, because I would just be playing something like b3, Bishop b2, defending the, the rook while also developing and attacking the queen. And I thought I would be okay, but I had missed totally this idea of bishop e6 and bishop c4. Oh, wow. Huh. Okay, I'm just wondering, and if you play bishop e6, if you play b3 here, then what happens? I, um, I believe I had considered this move alongside with the, uh, with the move I played in the game, which yeah was a four. Um, I think my opponent could sort of just take, and then after something like bishop b two, play something like queen c two, and attack my uh, my bishop, mm -hmm. and that at the end I I had nothing conclusive. My knight is still hanging on a uh, on a eight, and now my bishop is also hanging. So I I decided not to go for this line. Yeah, I guess you're losing some pawns here. Actually, I realize you can also just take the knight right away. Then on bishop b2, get this like counterattack. And uh, yeah, it seems like black keeps the uh, the extra piece here. Um, wow, yeah, it, it turned out really sharp. So it, it, this is like um, mystery. Got to go back and see. Like wow. Um, it's a cool tactic. I mean, knight takes d5, knight on c5 is saying if queen takes, you have bishop c4. That's a nice, nice point. Um, so knight takes d3, takes, takes. You saw the check. King h8, takes. Just missed queen d1 at the end. Hmm. And if not queen not d1, sure. if black goes like let's just say like knight d3 or something. Um, I can't see knight d3 on my board, but I'll oh. I'll make the move. Sorry. Um, freeze. Uh, yeah. Here I was just thinking I could um maybe develop my bishop, and uh, taking my knight on a8 is going to be a little bit hard. Because if I play my, my bishop, for example, let's say to d2 or something, I'm sort of, or for not to be in the way of the, of the, um, oh, I guess my pawn on e, e4 is hanging. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. It feels this would be pretty dangerous for white as well, just because, yeah. um, you know, it might take black some time to win the knight on eight, but this is, this is one of your pieces, right? So even if it's like out of the game. Even if black doesn't capture it, that's still kind of a, a problem. So, I mean, we kind of just got mixed up in, in all the tactics here, basically. It certainly happens, um, especially after losing a pawn. It's like, at this point, what do you have to lose? The <laughs> position's kind of kind of busted, so you might as well try some um, uh, something uh, complicated. Sure, there was queen b3 check as well, but I think it, it kind of runs into the, the same issues here, like... If nothing else, black can just bring the knight back and still enjoy like a big advantage. So anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on any one game. Let me just find uh, another one here. Always takes a second to load. OK. 
Okay. So the next game was against uh, Must Jab. I believe that was just a chess.com game of 1510 that I played uh, probably recently, at least in 2021. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. So we have some kind of weird Sicilian. F3. Oh, brutal. Okay. I hope you took advantage of this one. Okay, queenside castling, queen c2, g5, nice. I might have started with h5 just to um, harass the knight on, on g3 a bit, but uh, that's okay. Castles, h5. Do you remember this one? Yes, yes. I I think actually this is a more recent game. I think this was only a couple of days ago. Okay, cool. Yeah, looks like you did everything all right here. Okay, queen d7. You're switching over. Four. G6. Oh wow, somehow we found this endgame. But you yeah, before I had I had a really good attacking position, but I feel like I didn't take advantage of a pawn break that I could have had. So, for example, when um when his knight was on a three, I think, mm -hmm. uh, if we could go back to that point, um, yeah, here, I I think maybe at some point I could have taken on a three and then played g three sort of taking advantage of the fact that I that I'm forcing a pawn break, I'm forking a, a rook and a and a pawn and I'm forcing him to sort of open up the position. When after that, when I tried to switch over the queen to the to G seven, I, I, I had no pawn break. Right, yeah, because he plays um he finds this move F four. Mm -hmm. You're probably still doing well here. I mean your position is you just have so much space. Like I'm sure you're you're doing great. Um like maybe just even putting the bishop on d5 and taking advantage of the fact that white can't really go c4 because you have uh knight to d4 and um yeah i think you have like fantastic position uh chances here um yeah like your it felt like your attack is so good i mean a lot of players would even just play g3 at this moment which i think is totally reasonable um because whenever white, if white can't lock it up with h3, right, because of the knight on f2, then it's almost always a good opportunity to play this move. Because you're forcing the file to open. And this is one of the most, let's call it one of the most useful things for an attacker, is just like open files. And then we want to play either h4, h3, or if the knight uh, blocks on h3, then we'll have like f4, right, and bishop takes h3. And, uh, and then maybe even like rook hg8 to kind of pile on the pressure. Feels like an overwhelming attack. We just have like so yeah. much space in the position. Do you remember during the game? Did you have some like aversion to playing g three? Was there some reason you weren't sure about it? I think maybe I just wanted to make the position as perfect as possible. So I sort of brought in the bishop first, made sure all my pieces were active, and since I didn't see a uh, a clear continuation after g three, either after trading the bishop for the knight first or playing g3 immediately, I, I decided against it and I went for the for sort of getting my queen more active. Because I also thought maybe my queen wasn't going to be very active on this diagonal. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I think I think you might be right. Because like, yeah, you could have played g3 there. You can play g3 in this position and take with the bishop. And I would say this also looks extremely good for black because um, you're kind of breaking down the, the blockade. You're just going to go like h4, h3. Uh, basically no matter what and then f4 and and white won't be able to kind of hold it um or you can take on f2 like you said and then go g3 here and this also looks fantastic for um for black so um question about h4 you could start with h4 but the reason i want to start with g4 or with g3 is because while we have the chance to guarantee that we're taking something and that these pawns are getting traded this is this is why this is kind of the right moment because there's a rook on f2 why can't lock it up with h3 then it would be kind of harder to break through and if the rook moves back of course we just take on h2 uh immediately so that we can have the open file and then again we just want to keep breaking things up with like 
h4, h3. So this is kind of a fundamental principle of attacking chess. You just almost always want as many open lines as possible. Um, and then if the position is open enough, you know, this is the type of position where you start looking for like rook takes g2 type of um, sacrifices. Sorry if the position is, uh, might be jumping around a little bit. I meant to go here. Yeah, so this is the type of position where you just try to open up as many lines as possible and... Um, yeah, you just basically say, well, look, your rooks are on HAG8. So if the position opens up, I mean, number of pawns doesn't matter. None of that matters. It's all about opening up these rooks against white's king. And if you can do that, then you'll likely find a uh, checkmate. So yeah, there's something about wanting to just build up endlessly because it is nice to get the queen involved. But yeah, the queen was already kind of definitely having an influence in the position on, on D5. I mean, making it very difficult for white uh, to to do much of anything here. Um, so, yeah, maybe something, something to think about, um, because it, it kind of, like, fell too slow, and then all of a sudden white is, like, creating counterplay. Probably our position is still good, but, um, who knows, could be messy. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay, but then we end up finding this endgame. Um, rook g5... I think it's okay. Maybe d6 was a better in the position. Yeah, um, I mean, we definitely still want to play for activity. Like, my first thought would be just rook e8. Just give the pawn with check, and then leave white with this position, right? And now white has to figure out what to do. Because okay. you, yeah. you can still win, you know, tactically when the queens are off the board. Um, and if this rook gets to e1, that's like a very painful... Like these back rank pins are often brutal. Like if there's no obvious way to get out of the pin, that's like a piece that, that white is eventually losing. So this can be worth a pawn, two pawns. Let's just look at this for a sec. So white will go g3, I think, forced. Gotta save the back rank. And then let's say we give check. King g2... And, um, yeah, we just keep it real simple, like bishop e7, just with tempo. And then next move, rook d8. Feels like, feels like game over. Maybe rook, let's say rook d5, what tries? I think maybe you could go to rook, rook to f8 and try to just pile up on the knight. Yeah, that looks completely winning. Like rook f8, rook f1. White is just completely tied down um and then there's gonna be like even uh checks and, and yeah g1 pawn on g4 yeah um another way to possibly really make things difficult for white would be to go uh rook d8 and now trade off this rook and leave white with this pin that they have to deal with this would be pretty unpleasant too um, so a couple of different directions here with this kind of additional idea like bishop b6 and then then maybe some rook g1. But um, anyway, I think what you did is actually totally fine. Um, oh, actually there is king f2 there, so the rook kind of gets kicked around a bit. So yeah, I don't know about that last line. Yeah, I like your move rook yeah. f8 better yeah 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 king f2 rook h8 king g g2 and i can never win the h2 pawn i think yeah the rook actually loses we're not in time we needed the bishop on this diagonal um first so yeah this one actually doesn't quite work but uh this move rook f8 yeah white's position looks really really difficult um but i, I don't think actually that's a big deal i kind of like how you played it as well because you just trade off White's most active piece. I like rook e8 a lot. Just forcing, um, getting the second rank. And now this this is exactly kind of what we want. Like, just active rook, active bishop. Big, big advantage. Um, okay, let's see the technique. D2. I also wanted to mention that I was pretty low on time here. I usually spend a lot of time in the middle game or in the opening. And then I have very little time for my end game which is why it's usually messy. 
Mm. I see. You you have the like the ten second increment or yes. yes. Okay, that's good. That's really helpful. Yeah, yeah, we totally um kind of blew this one. I would imagine because of the time. Let's go back. Let's see what happened here. Because this felt like we have really, really nice position. Um, yeah, so b6, not really a great sign. <laughs> just because, like, the pawn's not hanging on c5. And I get the instinct to just want to defend it. But, like, you know, time's ticking, right? You got to get your king in <laughs> to win the game. Um, or you can play... Uh, like c4 and get your bishop in. This would be another way to kind of like improve your position. Um, or even b5, like b5, c4, like start pushing on the queen side. Because you have like such a huge advantage here with your rook on the seventh rank. Not just like your rook is more active, but your king is also guaranteed more active here because white's king is just cut off. So you basically have like two pieces that are dominating. Even though your king is still back on c8, the fact that it has the ability to get out is, is huge and it's going to start walking in. And of course your bishop here is going to be quite good, you know, with pawns on both sides of the board and the knight doesn't really have such like a safe square here. Knight is definitely a tricky piece in time scrambles, but objectively, yeah, like um, we have a lot of advantages here. So maybe it feels like we're being uh, ultra careful. Um, whereas I feel like this is a position where we can kind of just walk in and win. Um, you know, maybe this way actually would have been interesting. King uh, b7 and then just entering on the on the dark squares. Yeah, I think maybe that would have been even a little bit simpler than uh, than the plan I tried to adopt because after king d7, king e6, you have to find the way to get your king in. Meanwhile, the other way is sort of free. Right, so here, yeah, we ran into some checks. Um, and then, okay, probably a... a Time trouble blunder. That would be my guess here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it happens. Um, I'm sure you're still very close to winning here, like maybe rookie two or something. Um, actually, your idea h4 here makes a lot of sense too, because if takes, you have bishop e5, and you create, um, after you take on h2, you'll have this really strong g pawn. So this, yeah, probably was a winning idea. And then if, if white doesn't take, either you can take on g3 or... Um, you can push h3 and then really, really pose a lot of issues for white uh, in that structure. Um, he also played bishop e5 to try to put a lot of pressure on g3, seeing as he can't take. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. You can just play bishop e5 next move and break through. So yeah, sometimes you need like, you, you just need more time to, to find, um, yeah. which is, well, that's what rapid is. I mean, it's definitely quicker than classical chess. If this was a classical game, you have more time you'd have time to kind of like figure it out. So uh, not a big deal. Um, okay, well, actually, but we ended up winning the game anyway, which is interesting, I think. Let's see, take, take, because white basically gets out extra pawn. Oh, nice, wow. You got in with the king and pawn end game. Apparently here he's still drawn, which I'm not so sure how that works. Huh, yeah, engine's giving like a5, some weird move. Yeah. So here... Three. Yeah, actually, I think it's a5, and then he can sort of bring his king backward, and his a-pawn is so advanced that he ends up queening at the same time. Oh, wow, miracle. Miracle draw. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> king b7, uh, king b6, here, here, and yeah, we draw at the same time, wow. Um, okay, so yeah, we got a little lucky at the end there, but it happens. King f3, totally natural move for white, and now he's like a tempo too slow on this line. Wow. He played a5 here, that's cool. Take four, take this one. Nice, nice. Okay, good technique at the end. All right, let's look at the next one. Um, okay, this is your game against 
Math Matenin. So we're playing white here. Do you remember this one? Um, not quite. I think this was early 2021. I think this was back in January. Oh, okay. Let's see. Oh, wow. Okay, a bunch of tactics in this game. <laughs> H6 and yeah, all over. Okay. Yeah. Although I don't want to talk about it too much if you don't really remember what happened. I just kind of want to see see how it went no i mean it's it's fine i kind of i remember the uh the analysis and i also sort of looked over the games before the class um so i mean i got i went a four because i i thought i had a pretty good space advantage pretty yeah. good development advantage and that i could maybe go for a king side attack yeah four is normal um But after after knight to to d5 and knight takes, I think maybe I'm giving him too much of an opportunity to activate his queen and sort of centralize it without me being able to um, put any more put any pressure on the queen and sort of develop with with tempo, which I think maybe was a problem for me in this game. Also losing a queen, but I, I think in this position after rookie one, I think my position is still okay, even though I'm down a pawn, mainly because he hasn't developed his queen side, and now his queen is in the center and it's sort of subject to attack a little bit. Yeah, no, you still have some compensation here. Um, though in view of bishop d6, I don't know, maybe I would have preferred like bishop f2. Because you still can get the rookie one tempo here, but also on bishop d6 you have bishop g3. Yeah. I'm not really sure, but um, rookie one here, here, queen f6, and then oh, I guess you could have taken on b5 here. That's kind of a, it's a nice trick. Yeah, I I hadn't seen that. Um, it was a lot better than uh the knight takes c6 because I think then I he gets to trade off some of his undeveloped pieces for some of my very developed pieces like this knight on the right. d4 that was had moved a lot yeah and so now bishop takes a7 that's a really interesting <laughs> moment yeah it's like here i thought i was totally winning because i thought i was just winning a rook but i had missed that um he could sort of at least keep me in a draw yeah you can take here and uh yeah now this is one of those tough positions where you have like a million moves and it's like hard to know what to uh what to calculate yeah um especially sort of in a in a rapid game where you i'm already a bit down on the clock because i've, I've had to calculate a lot mm -hmm. it's hard to determine Right. Um, yeah, my first thought here was like queen f3 because it's like... So hg, queen takes c6. Okay, we kind of saw how that plays out. White's king is just uh, ends up too weak there. Um, queen f3 is a nice move because it's like... You don't take on b8 until black starts taking some material as well. And then you hold on to this kind of like more important uh, light squared bishop. So I'll show you guys how the game went. It was hg... Queen takes, bishop takes here, and um, yeah, basically like very difficult position for white. Like already bishop b7 is uh, quite annoying, black tried queen b6, which was also okay, and then after king f1, like this was a deadly attack. I guess you could have done something different here, like uh, king, king g2, g2, I g2, guess. Sir. Yeah, because yeah, king h2 we run into queen f2, so probably king g2. Um, and then, I mean, the position is still messy. Like, black can just take on b8, and 
and he has like a bunch of compensation for the exchange. Maybe white is better, but it's it's difficult. Um, so yeah, we often want to look for some kind of like stabilizing move, like a queen f3, because then maybe we get the queens off the board, and as long as black's rook on b8 is hanging, you know, we're kind of like, kind of know like you're never going to be down material here. Um, like bishop takes e1, we can maybe take on f6 first, take on b8, one of these moves. Let's try this. Then feels like it's kind of safe for you. Um, yeah. But, uh, okay, yeah, these decisions yeah. are always tough, especially with limited time. Um... Okay, yeah, you could argue also e5 maybe a little bit early because you're left with this kind of isolated pawn. I don't know if black really reacted in, in the best possible way here, but um, yeah, I'm not sure about this move. It might be kind of early here. A lot of players would start either with a3 to stop b4 um, so you don't lose your e4 pawn or like bishop f3 might be possible as well. Kind of setting up e5 maybe under better circumstances. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm not a big expert in this opening, but yeah, just something to to consider. But um, let me let's go to another one. Because really, this is about just getting a sense of your play, not really like having to analyze every single game to uh, yeah. to death. Okay, next one here, we're facing the the French. Do you remember this one? Yeah, this was played at a at an online tournament, mm -hmm. I think, a couple of months ago. Um, a local online tournament. I think the time control was 25-10 or something like that. Cool. Okay, looks like we just won a pawn here. So that was good. Okay, get these double pawns, doesn't really matter. King d2. Huh. Alright, we traded off the rooks. We'll get back to this. <laughs> King d2 definitely strikes me as an odd move. Uh, I get that you're trying to stop um, rook e2. But a lot of players would notice like rook e2 is not really even a threat because of black's back rank. Okay, yeah. Right, because like rookie two, you can meet that with knight f4, uh, or knight c3, and black would have to go back. Um, I don't know, it seems wrong to kind of get in the way of your own rook, just my feeling. Um, so uh, what, other, what other way do you think um, I should proceed in this position? Yeah, that's a good question. So maybe like, Maybe a3, b3, or even both, just to kind of slowly um, get some space on, on the queen side. Uh, and and then you don't have to worry about your back rank and your king can kind of advance as well. Um, yeah, another possible idea would be to like just bring the knight back to e3. Um, and then you just kind of shore up the rook and then you just control this one open d file. Uh, and then again, just kind of slowly advancing on the queen side, because you're, you probably, I mean, you're basically winning this on the queen side, because you have an extra pawn here, right, a potential passer, and then your king is also much closer to the action, so it's like you have an extra piece, basically. Um, so as long as you just keep the situation under control, like, you're, yeah, basically should be winning this one pretty handily. The double pawns are ugly, but hard for, black doesn't really have time to do anything uh, to them. So king d2, I don't know, it's probably fine. It just kind of strikes me as going in, like, slightly the, the wrong direction. Because now your king is on e2, like, defending your weaknesses, but it, it should actually be on your queen side supporting your pawns, I think. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, but then you make absolutely correct decision to trade rooks and simplify into this knight endgame where you have uh, extra pawn and just huge advantage. King comes in, 
So now I feel like you're in control. But somehow, oh wow. Yeah, we kind of get into trouble here. Yeah. Wow, so this turned around very, very quickly. Um, yeah, I feel like this shouldn't have happened. I mean, your king is on e3, and then like three moves later, black's king is on d5, and you haven't made any progress. It's right? quite sort of I selected this, uh, this game because it's a game where I was better since the opening, uh, but I, I failed to convert because I, I misplayed the end game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like maybe seeing kind of a pattern where you have like this advantage and then are not capitalizing on it in maybe the most like concrete way or let's say the most like because it doesn't have to be concrete let's say you're not um uh kind of like not pulling the the trigger in some of these positions because uh, this is definitely feels like something where we should be much better even if we weren't up a pawn just the fact that our king is like much closer to the center and our knight is a little bit more active is, is kind of nice but with the extra pawn then i think it should really be um uh, a decent position so one idea would be to just immediately go after the a6 pawn with something like knight b4 because if you get these pawns to push forward then they kind of become easier to attack like a5 knight c6 for example um and then a4 knight d4 just as a sample line so black of course can't okay. trade knights that would just be totally losing has to play something passive like knight to c7 now you can start bringing in your king with king to e4 or you can slide over this way and head towards b4 and this seems like you're you're winning this pretty easily yeah i think that's sort of one of the main things i missed in this game that i have this uh three to two majority on the queen set and that i failed to sort of put my efforts into creating a pass pawn on that side mm mm-hmm yeah, that is kind of like our, our winning plan here, basically just making a, a pass pawn, either trading knights, winning the king and pawn endgame, or making a pass pawn and converting that. So another very um, logical move here after king e8, because it seemed like what happened was like you couldn't play king d4, and then king e4, you don't really see like where the king is going. So you decide to play b4, like maybe fixing the weaknesses. Um, mm -hmm. But... The problem was like this knight on e6 is just kind of in your way. So like another logical move is knight f4. Just challenging the knight knowing that black can't allow a trade. So black has to give ground. And this is why knight endgames are often compared to like king and pawn endgames. Um, this is kind of like a uh, general prin principle. Like knight endgames are often very similar because when you have these two knights that are kind of fighting for space, a lot of times they get into each other's way. And whoever has the advantage in the king and pawn endgame can always allow a knight trade, right? You're always okay with a knight trade, and that means that the other knight now has to move away and, and give up space. Um, so now black has to play like knight c5 or something, or, or knight g5. Knight g5, probably a blunder. We just kicked the knight with h4 and nowhere to go. Yeah, trade. Um, yeah, it has to trade. And then if knight c7 or knight c5, then the king starts walking in. And once your king gets in the range of like d5, King C6, and then it's all over because the pawns are just going to fall. The king is just such a powerful piece here. Um, so, yeah, just lacking a little bit of like killer instinct in um, some of these endgames where if your king just gets in, it's, it's basically going to be decisive. In this game, actually, one of the previous games too, like when you had your rook on the uh, the seventh rank as black, and you had the bishop, and you had like the king, if you just got your king in, I think you win that one uh, really easily. Yeah. Um, and then... Yeah, here actually we could have traded knights with knight f4, but now it might be... Now it might be your other game where your opponent traded into this and <laughs> up a pawn, but totally losing. Um, so it was good we avoided that, but now black gets super active. We play a4... We do create this passer, but black gets their counterplay. Now it's like kind of unclear. Yeah, and after that, I just missed a, a knife work where he would mm -hmm. sort of get rid of one of my queenside pawns, and I'm absolutely lost here. 
Yeah, the yeah, Knight is just stuck. Um, looks like his his technique was was good. Okay, yeah. So basically, they're just kind of not um, not going in when we we had the moment, but otherwise, like a, a very very well well played game, I thought. So yeah, you are playing solid. Um, just have to work on your technique a little bit, and we'll we'll talk about that. But let's look at some some more games. Okay, next game we're playing white. Is this your main repertoire, Grand Prix Attack? Yeah. Cool, cool. Okay, and uh, do you remember this one? What was the time control here? Uh, pretty sure this is just a 15 time game. Gotcha. Oh, wow. Interesting pawn sack. Nice. Get it back. We won the piece. So yeah, good tactics here. Our queen is hanging. I guess could have taken as well, actually, just simple. Knight takes, take uh, on e8, let's say. And because you're hitting the other rook, he has to take back. Yeah, I, I have failed to see this. So I mean, he's running the other rook. Well, you did it. I think is also good. Does he have a move? Oh, he has knight d6. Sorry, I missed this one. Okay, so you could have held actually somehow. Although, it, mm, I have a feeling you would still find a way to win this game because black is under serious pressure. So, queen c8, okay, we take this one. And now we just trade everything off. Okay, g3. Oh wow. Oh no, <laughs> we blew this one. Oh no. Okay, I'm glad you sent me this game. You know, Gustavo, a lot of people that come on the show, they try not to send me their embarrassing games. <laughs> they try to like, they curate them, but I'm glad you sent me this one because this shows exactly the problem. You are like completely winning. Yeah. And then as soon as you realize you're winning, you start making like these really um, kind of like passive moves actually, like G3 was already like totally unnecessary. Like, you can calculate rookie one, you're threatening the back rank, right? You're 2600 in tactics. So start with this move, you know? Yeah. And then and then force black to, like, weaken their back ranks, or to weaken, you know, h6 somehow, and then, you know, and then you'll find knight h4, like, the pawn's not even hanging. I mean, you have, like, a million ways of winning this position uh, with, with the extra piece. So... I think we're being really, really cautious. Even if you're low on time with a 10 second increment, it should be enough to find like a reasonable move that's not like um, ultra passive. Because it feels like you are kind of going into um, like turtle mode. Like here, like with queen e2, like there's not really a whole lot black can do to you. You know, a lot of players, they just play king f2 here. And then, okay, you can see like there's no checks. If your king is next to the knight, you're always kind of safe. You'll always be able to block with the queen or something. So, like, with an extra piece, you have you have a lot of room. There's no way you get made it here. You know, there's, like, nothing nothing black can really do to you. Maybe you can blunder all your pawns, but only if you're super, super careful. That's kind of how we start blundering, because then you're, as your time ticks down, you know, you get more and more nervous. I mean, I'm speaking from experience. You know, it happens to everyone. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, we got to be more more decisive. Um, and now this one is, um, yeah, now it just gets too tricky and it's like, it's kind of like, it's not clear what we're playing for because we start playing well, I think with like knight g6 and f5, but then we go back to like passive and then it ends up, uh, just getting super messy and then, uh, yeah, yeah blunder happens. Um, I sort of, uh, fixated on this, um, this idea that I was going to play something like, uh, like not queen d5 but just the mate in general on on f8 with the queen the knight and the pawn and uh i, I failed to realize in this position you know just queen d5 would be a winning pawn that king and pawn end game with the knight 
Absolutely. Actually, that's a good point. I think a lot of us, when we when we're low on time, we kind of tunnel vision and we see one idea, one possible checkmate, and we try to set it up. But the reality is, yeah, you probably have like five, six different plans that win this position. Uh, like, you know, putting the knight on f4 and then playing like queen h5 check might be super strong. Or the simplest way, um, like you said, is just queen d5, like just trading queens. Any queen trade and you should be winning easily. Um, especially in a time scramble, trading queens is nice because then you can start like making very, very quick moves and, and you can convert those uh, easily. Um, so yeah, it's important to remind yourself like there's many ways you can win this one and any queen trade is good. And uh, yeah, once you play c4, then actually, yeah, it's kind of all over, like queen f3, queen d5, that would have been, um, that would have been good. Um, okay, so yeah, something we'll, again, we'll definitely talk about, but let's look at, I think we have a couple more games to go through. Okay, next one, you are playing uh, white. Sorry? I think you're playing white in this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This was a, I, I believe this is a game I played in over the board tournament about a year ago. Cool. Um, I guess a 16-20 feeder. Okay, cool. So this over the board, nice. Yes. 90 mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, winter war is a tough opening. But you handled it well. Got the dark squares. Oh, but he has some counterplay. And. Oh, I had check and takes. Oops. Oh wow. Oh, you got there. Wow, this game is like uh, filled with surprises. So he goes here. Probably should have just like pulled the bishop back. So he misses this one. Very nice. Let's take here. Okay, now you get your king to safety. And uh, you don't trade queens. Good. Absolutely correct decision there not to trade queens because his king is way weaker than yours. Even though you have the extra exchange. Wow. <laughs> Crazy game. Nice, nice. And then two queens always stop the checks. Cool. Um, wow, what a crazy game. I like this plan of this, like, queen g7, queen h6. It's so funny. Yeah, um, I, I, I was surprised over the board that, uh, you know, I could sort of win the exchange kind of force. But after mm -hmm. an analysis, I, I realized that the exchange isn't worth that much in this position. Mainly because of my weak F2 pawn. Yeah, unfortunately, Black ends up getting like a ton of compensation for it. So maybe it wasn't even the best thing to do. I, although I do think here you are kind of, you are solid enough. Maybe the bishop should have gone to E2. Um, this is kind of a typical way of trying to defend against the knight on e5. Um, but, uh, oh, sorry, I'm looking at a different line here. I was looking at this one, but, um, yeah, this was like the ultimate, like, don't trade queens game, because you avoided it here, and then you avoided it later uh, as well. But yeah, I don't know, maybe... Yeah, of course, there are other ways of playing the position, too. Um, let me check out this last game. And, uh, okay, here we're playing black. Or oh, are you a King's Indian player? Um, I actually can't see the position on the board. It takes a little bit for, oh. for it to load. Sorry. Um, 
Kings Indian, I, I, I think that was a game with C4, right? With the English? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I usually play the Grunfeld, but I, I couldn't find a way to, to get in the Grunfeld. So oh, I just played the Kings Indian with C5, I which see. is, which was a part of my repertoire before. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, a lot of Grunfeld players, they, they play D5 in this position. And there are some, there are some lines here. It's pretty similar to a Grunfeld. You still play Bishop G7. You try to take the Knight on C3 and kind of similar play. So you could definitely do that one. Um, but okay, there's nothing wrong with the Kings Indian either. Uh, so H3, and then it actually goes into Benoni basically with D5 and, and E6. So E6 is a good move. How do you feel about these kinds of Benoni positions in general? Typically, I like them because I I usually play the um the dragon with with black the Sicilian dragon so I I feel very very comfortable very at home with the sort of c5 pawn and the uh, fianchetto dark sword bishop mm. that's mainly why I used to play the the c5 king's Indian but I changed over I see why did you switch. Um, I started getting unfavorable results with the uh, with the C5 Kings Indian, and uh, I sort of realized that some lines I, you know, looked at master games and everything, and I did not like the positions that Black got out of the opening. Okay. Um, yeah, no, you're doing quite fine in this one. Uh, I mean, this end game was, of course, end game got super messy but um well, let's see this freaking game oh nice I took that one and then oh no you gotta bring the king back Yeah, here after c7, apparently uh, king c3 was um, <laughs> was drawn because I could push my rook to c6 and then go behind the rook, play king b6, and take the pawn. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing idea. Yeah, I wouldn't have found this one either. <laughs> At least not in a blitz game. Um, oh well. So, let's go back though. Actually, I really liked your position... Like bishop g5, queen b6, he gives up the dark square to bishop. Um, and uh, then you went for this. So you actually end up winning a pawn, but like he gets some counterplay. Yeah, my my uh, queen side is very underdeveloped. Right, right. Um, so and I, I feel like know. development also isn't very natural for me. I mean, my bishop my leg squared bishop it's very hard to see where it's going if it goes to d7 it's blocking my knight if it goes to f5 it's gonna get kicked away with uh, g4 my knight is also sort of kind of clumsy i think yeah that's one of the problems with this position that can happen is that your um your minor pieces fight for the same squares although trading off one or two of them usually makes this task a lot easier so in this case you you can develop the knight like knight to a6 knight c7 um, or knight d7, knight e5, or knight d7, knight b6, and then and then the bishop can come out. So I, I do think you actually have a good version here. Um, this is okay, although my instinct in this kind of position would be not to give up the dark square bishop um, for kind of like because it's not like a healthy extra pawn. You have to deal with some some initiative, and instead maybe playing for this like a6 b5 plan. So. Um, like on on queen c2 maybe like a6 first to cover the b5 square white castles and then like queen c7 then you try to play b5 or you try to bring the knight to like uh, d7 and e5 and uh, i'd actually just try to keep your dark squared bishop alive i mean you probably understand the power of this one um quite well but that's just a small thing not like not hugely important um But, uh, yeah, okay, Gustav, I think I'm ready to make this, uh, this diagnosis. 
Um, I definitely feel like, yeah, you gotta be, I think maybe trying to play a little bit more aggressively in, in some cases, like, especially when you have the advantage and you're trying to like convert a position, um, feels like you're being a little bit too careful in that, in that process. That can be a really good thing in many cases because you kind of like can restrict your opponent's counterplay, but there, there is kind of a balance to it and there can be a point where it becomes too much and you just need to go for the kill and, and finish the game. Um, so the way to work on this, I mean, partly it's psychological. You have to kind of consciously maybe even remind yourself, like when you have an advantage, you need to like focus and try to try to convert it as efficiently as possible. Um, and another thing you can do is maybe study, uh, some games of like some attacking players. Cause then I think you'll see how they can really you'll see how they kind of finish off positions. You know, they find like combinations, they find a way to like mate the king. Even if they're doing well, they always want to find a way to just like completely open up the position, you know, destroy the shelter in front of their opponent's king and just deliver mate. Um, so a couple of good books are the like the attacking manuals um, from uh, Jakob Agard are, are pretty well considered. Um, but there's also lots of attacking players worth studying, like Tal and Kasparov, Shirov, all these guys, like super, super interesting players. Um, I'm sure there's tons of content, like, on YouTube as well, of people just going through, like, games of, like, famous attacking players. Um, I feel like that would be the thing, because, yeah, it feels like you're... Uh, yeah, nowadays Dubov is is a really good player to look at as well, because it, it does feel like your calculation is probably all right, um, and so yeah, I just want to put you in a better position to um, to use it. Um, does that does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah. I uh, I sort of noticed when uh, picking my games that I. Uh usually tend to have a really good position and then just not not be able to convert it because I get too passive. Right, right. And um, yeah, I mean, another thing you can do actually I think is really useful is um, it would be to actually watch some high-level Blitz players and try to pay attention to how they convert in the end game. Because you have all these guys like, you know, Hikaru and Danya that are like super, super fast. And even when they have like 30 seconds left on their clock or a minute left, they're still converting these like tricky end games and finding ways to win. And they're not always winning. They don't like play perfectly, but you'll kind of see what ideas they look for to finish the game. And you'll see things like them just bringing in the king, like rushing the king and rook end games, trying to activate the king in every position, trying to create past pawns, trying to you know sacrifice a pawn so another pawn can break through. So you'll you'll definitely get some ideas in terms of technique and and the conversion, and how to um, uh, how to finish off a lot of these games. Um, you can also go on YouTube and find lots of videos of uh, people playing blitz like in person actually like. World Blitz Championship. Magnus is obviously like an uh, insanely good Blitz player. Yeah, actually, forget everyone else. Just watch Magnus play some Blitz. His technique is very, very good. His instincts are incredible. Um, maybe that could be a fun project for you. Like, watch some of his Blitz games and then go and analyze the end game and see, like, did he play it accurately or did his opponent, you know, miss some defense or, or what happened there? I think that would give you some, some really good insight in how these players often. Because they're not trying to just convert the end game; they're trying to convert it quickly in a lot of cases. Because they, of course, just don't have a lot of time left on their clock, and so they don't have time to calculate something complicated. They just have to find a very practical and, and natural idea. Yeah, I I actually kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that. That I think maybe might be a problem. And uh, funnily enough, I learned it from uh, Chess Strategy for Glo for Club Players. Um, he speaks. He says that. Um, when when you're in an end game, you shouldn't necessarily look for for moves like for or calculate uh, a line. You should look for plans and mm. sort of compare plans and uh, try to decide which plan is best. Which I think maybe could have a lot to do with um, 
with my, my with my conversion and also um in terms of like blitz streams i believe naradetsky has a series on youtube speed run to 3000 where he sort of plays blitz games against categories from you know lower levels uh my levels and um sort of tries to go up to 3000 which i think maybe could be helpful in that sense yeah absolutely i think those videos are really instructive um that's a good point about like the end game and thinking about how to convert it it is very useful to get let's say like a schematic picture of what you're aiming for because then yeah it's like you don't really have to calculate move by move you just know like okay you want your rook on the second rank you want to pass pawn you want an active king in the center you know you want to bring your knight to this outpost or you want to bring your bishop to this diagonal if even when you're low on time if you can get some kind of sense of the scheme you're looking for where are like what's the best spot for all of your pieces that can actually help you make decisions very very quickly because you know where everything is supposed to go um yeah. so that's definitely a really important point about the end game and in classical chess it's important to kind of spend time to kind of plan it out like long term like where you want to position everything and then over time you'll build up these instincts like you'll just kind of know exactly where everything needs to go what your pawns should do which squares you need to control whether to put them on the same color of your bishop or opposite color or which weaknesses to fix you know how to create squares for all your pieces um this will kind of just become like second second nature once you have enough of this uh experience um so well with most players i mean there's lots of stuff you can um work on i like the book that you're reading um at some point it would be useful for you to read uh some endgame books as well um just like in the future uh the book endgame strategy total classic by sharashevsky um there are others as well that i'm uh, a fan of but that's always been the one that kind of teaches a lot of the fundamental principles of how to play uh typical in-game positions and kind of the style um, yeah, in terms of uh of endgame books, I've I've read one. I read um Endgame Workshop by Bruce Pandolfini. Oh, cool. I don't I don't know if you if you recognize it, but that's sort of the only thing I've studied, and I studied it a couple of of I actually think it was like about a year ago. So mm -hmm. I should maybe get on that. Yeah, honestly, I haven't seen it, so I I couldn't tell you, but um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at some point, it's, I mean, often very useful just to see some, like, classic end games and, and get an idea for how a lot of these positions are played, where everything should go, what to do with the pieces, what to exchange, and, and these kinds of plans. Um, that's just kind of, I think, useful for, yeah, basically universally all players. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, you're in you're in great shape, uh, Gustavo. You you're playing frequently. You're doing your tactics. You're analyzing your games. You're reading books and like learning about strategy. Uh, you're involved in the game. <laughs> it's very important to like really spend a lot of time with the game, a lot of uh, time over the board. You know, working through positions or analyzing something, analyzing your games, playing. Um, these are the things that give you like this long term experience where you um truly become like uh, a chess player how long have you even been playing by the way uh so i technically began playing when i was little um but i sort of only went to scholastic tournaments and i only got to about a thousand um online playing strength and uh but i took i took the game back up um about a year ago about a i think it was on October of 20 oh that's right 2019 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so you haven't been like serious for all that long honestly it's like and chess is such a deep game there are so many ideas that it really takes time you know to um to make like t tons and tons of progress but you're you're on the right track I think you're in really really good shape um just got to keep uh, keep trucking like keep playing keep playing and the way it works is like you work hard for several months and then eventually like it clicks in it's rarely let's say linear like you go up and up and up like every week you gain some points but rather over time everything starts to kind of settle in and click in and all of a sudden you wake up and you're like a much stronger player than you were a few months ago so as long as yeah, you keep I've putting noticed. in those hours it'll happen yeah i've noticed that that happens a lot when i'm 
playing online, I won't make any progress for a couple of months and then I'll go up like a hundred points in a week, which it just confuses me, but it's <laughs> yeah, very typical. I don't know why it happens, but yeah, it's very common. You work for a while and then all of a sudden you, you shoot up. Um, so the important thing is to just like keep working, keep kind of uh, investigating and like exploring the game trying to read books that you find interesting, trying to study players that you find interesting, you know, just, and there's so much content out there that like, if something's not really like clicking with you, just find, find another something to watch. Cause there's so much good stuff out there and so many good teachers that you can, uh, you can learn from. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? No, I think I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. It was great to have you. Thanks for doing the show and, and sharing your games. I hope, I hope the advice has been useful and um, the idea of the show is to one day maybe check in with you again in a couple months, see how you're doing, see if you were able to incorporate any of the stuff we just talked about and then um, uh, yeah, see see where you're at in a few months. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I welcome that idea. Okay, cool. I look forward to it. Well, thank you so much, Gustavo. Uh, have a great rest of your day and uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, this show is weekly. Thursdays, 3.30 p.m. Pacific time to 5 p.m. And uh, yeah, we work with a new player every week, break down their games and uh, try to give them some some tips for, for the future. Uh, you can catch previous episodes of this on my YouTube channel and uh, this one will be going up there as well. All right.